So I can start by uh, asking you, uh, what was your inspiration for having you in the arena that you're in today? Yeah, well, um, from the time I was a boy, I mean about six years old, I found myself listening to music and liking music more than any other thing. Uh, Jackie Opel, a guy called Jackie, and another guy called Piffler used to pass at night singing and I they used to pass almost the same time every night. I would hear these voices harmonizing and things just passing by the house. I didn't knew that my mother knew that I would be listening because all she would say, you hear the happy jacks. I don't know if that was the name themselves or if she does the name she gave them or what. But it was like in a way in the old time there's nobody called a happy jack. It means that you're carefree or that you you're just happy. And um, again, I know which one she was referring to. But boy, I I just love to hear this guy sing. And then I remember Seymour Bishop asking my mother to let me sing um, at Kensington Oval in the Chapman's Lane Choir. And I went, and we actually won. It had nothing to do with me. I always tell people it had nothing to do with me. Because I remember just being there to sing, not being there to be anything fancy or anything outstanding because we had great singers in that choir. And then after that I remember uh, Edie Motley, Ernest Dighton Motley was the mayor who of Bridgetown at the time. We don't have no mayor anymore. We don't have a, 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 we have a city without the mayor. <laughs> um, he had his election and uh, I remember everybody around me talking about Motley and Motley and Motley and Papa Mott. And I wrote this song called Vote for Motley and Get Free Cakey. That was my first song. I remember that actually. <laughs> All right then. That's a long time ago. Yeah. And after that then, I started to find that I was writing these songs. I started to doubt myself because it was coming so frequently. I started to doubt myself. So I would ask people, you ever heard this melody? And they go, you know, who says that? You ever hear this song? You ever hear this tune? No. I could not have written this. I could, but I was writing it. It, it was it's coming. Then, all back then, I realized I could write fast. And a variety, writing melodies was never a problem for me. Lyrics was never a problem either. But I always thought that, that lyrics shouldn't overburden a song. That she complimented. So by the time I reached 12, 13, I was writing, writing. By the time I reached 16, I was in a competition to encouragement from Romeo, Mighty Romeo. And I came third that year. In fact, I think they tied me with sugar for third or something like that. And then that was 1965. And 1968, 67, they voted me as Calypsonian of the year. They had no competition in that. In 68, I won the crown. In 69, I won the crown. And I remember a man in Darnoville saying to me, Look, youngster, tell me the truth. Who writing these songs to you? He's a diminutive man. Yeah, a little man. He used to work for the advocate as a journalist. And he was also a referee, he was a sportsman. He used to play for Rangers Club and all that. Youngster, tell me the truth. Who writing these songs? I said, I did. Come on, look. These are too advanced for you. You, you, you could not be writing these songs. I said, I did. I was like, scared of him in a way because remember, and then they're glad to get an interview. You know, you respect these men and things. And he was a well known and highly respected journalist at The Advocate. So, in order to get this story and thing, you know, you're going through men like that. And he said to me, ah, oh, that was in 68. And I remember 69 when he wrote again. He said, tell me the truth who writing these songs. I said, I am writing myself. He said, no man, too well constructed. Let my man know poetry. I know this, I know that. He start calling a lot of fancy names. I never heard about till then. <laughs> you know. Right, run and all kind of poets suck so out uh HW Lamb fella and all kind of names. So this 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 structured along those lines. Don't tell me that this is just that you pick up this just like that. Because you're right this. <laughs> And after I win the crown again, he came to me and said, Youngster, you've got a lot of potential. And once you don't go straight, you're going to be upstanding. Never forget it. And 
and I kept on writing from there. And then I went into, um, like I said, the competition, one. And then I was working on the boat, 67, 68, 69, 70. Uh, took the two boats, the Uni and the Buccaneer. One was a sloop, one was a catch. Belonged to a man called Captain Carlo, Carlo Man Mandoy. And I learned so much on those boats. My man named Captain Shepherd. He just passed away just weeks ago. But man, what an outstanding captain. He was so good. He looked up in the sky, a blue sky, and said to you, hey, it's going to rain in like half an hour. Just looking at the clouds or looking at the water. I would love to be able to have that kind of skill. But I learned a lot under him in terms of dealing with human beings talking to people and you know French people came on Italians Germans Swedes Americans I told them lots of Americans lots of Canadians at the time and a lot of English because it's primarily Americans Canadians and English but then you will get a spattering of different Europeans you know and um, it was such a learning experience you know to meet these different people from these countries that you hear about but you could never think you would get a chance to go to and then having uh, one from a number of Cajuns and emigrating to the United States living there living in New York learning the runnings of New York knowing what is Manhattan knowing the difference between a Manhattan and a Brooklyn knowing the difference between an A train and a, and a, and a, um, a, a IRT you know knowing the difference between walking on Broadway and walking on uh, 42nd Street, the rhythm, the feel, you know, experiencing Harlem, um, talking to these people who aspire to be these Broadway people or whatever they are, people with great talent, a lot of them have never made it, but were fantastically talented. I mean, it was, no uh, other boy fool you that only the top comes to the top, that's nonsense. I met some great artists along the way that never made money. And then to meet people like Benny King and me over the years, Mick Jagger, Sting, mm -hmm. all through Eddie Grant, you know. I mean like I have no regrets at all. And then get the opportunity to travel to Sweden, Holland, Finland, Denmark, Belgium, uh, Germany a lot of times, England, naf 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 times all over America, whether it be uh, New York, Washington, Boston, Connecticut, Philadelphia, Texas, Florida, um, jo uh, Atlanta, in Georgia, um, you know, I mean, like, I can't even call all of them, uh, Indianapolis in Indiana, you know, and, and performing in most of these places. And then I remember working as a boy in New York, and my friend Leslie Pinder, I said to him, we were we were at the, uh, uh, walking under the Statler Hilton. And I said to him, you see that Madison Square Garden there? One day I'm going to be singing at that place. And if they give me one pass, I'm going to give it to you. And I remember the Sunday when we got off the A train. And we took another train into 42nd Street. And we got off. And we were walking, it was fairly chilly. It was in May, but it was still chilly. And as soon as we got down around Pennsylvania, uh, there was a post office right near the Madison Square Garden. And he looked up, he said, Mighty, look, your name up in the lights right there, look, you, Sparrow, Rose. And he started to cry. So I remember you telling me as a boy that, what, that one day you're going to sing here. But the singing is one thing, but now to see your name up there, because we used to look up and see the Knicks, and we would see James Brown, and we would see, you know, uh, Richard Franklin or, or somebody like that, and now look at them in the same place, in the same lights and everything. I said, yes, I promise you that once I get it there, like you, if it's one ticket, and I had one ticket, I would never forget that day because Isaac McCloud, who, who had produced the show, uh, the Mother's Day concert, that first one, he produced many, 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 but that one, he was trying to get in the garden that evening, and they wouldn't let him in. 
Although he was trying to explain it, he's a guy who produced a show. The man said, where's your pass? Where's your this? He said that. He said, I forgot it in the wrong jacket. I hurried to get here. I said, sorry, you can't get it here. And Sparrow came out just by accident. And my closet, Sparrow's what? And the man, the man said, Sparrow, you know him? And Sparrow said, but he's the guy who produced the show. He said, oh, man, sorry, man, but you couldn't take a chance. And the two of us went in backstage and the show us a way how to get in the, the garden as opposed to front mm -hmm. right and we went in the back mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. that was my first experience of seeing at Madison Square Garden and then chance then to sing at Carnegie Hall uh, chance to, to, to you know set to play on the damn first so I was uh, acting out in at uh, Cammy Hall and oh my god uh, the Harlem Culture Center the Billy Hall the theater in Brooklyn I mean it's like that New York experience was special for me because I also remember working in the garment center and um, there was a man called Frank Cherry who was the president of um, District 65 Workers Union, mm -hmm. which was the biggest workers union at the time for workers uh, in garment center. I don't know if it is now, but Frank Cherry used to stammer. I, we, were, we were at this place called Starwood Fabrics, right? This is on 34th and 7th. Mm -hmm. Frank's came I, at last time to me. Not to me. He came to the building and he said, Youngster, you work here? I said, Yes. He said, I, I want to unionize the shop, man. So I thought it was like a con game because you know New York full of cons. So I said, What's the shop? He said, I, I, I'm the union representative, man. I, I want to unionize the shop. And we got. Uh, uh, the Supreme Court, uh, 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 is a new, uh, there's a paper downstairs, you read it, man. The paper was there for months, I never saw it, you know. I was working, cutting cloth, I never saw that paper that said that, uh, primarily what it said was not necessarily verbatim, that if the two-thirds of the workers wanted to join the union, that they, that they have the right and that they will automatically be unionized. There was a man called... Sid Warner, who was the head of Starwood. I remember as Christmas playing, like going to the Christmas party. And all that time we didn't unionize yet. So I went in to Warner. I said, Mr. Warner, I play music, you know. He said, Yeah, right, you know, everybody plays music. I said, No, no, I can really play. So at the Christmas party, I had two men playing these. Uh, what is it called? Constantine, I think. I can't remember the proper name for it now. Accordion. Accordions. Mm -hmm. Playing these accordions. And I, Mr. Warner had sent me to Sayosi in Long Island to get a guitar. He said, if you could play, then this is my friend. He called the guy, hey, Jack, I have a youngster here. He said, he plays music, man. Do you still sell those guitars? Mm -hmm. The mama said, yes. said, okay, you go to Sayosi in Long Island. And that is the address, blah, blah, blah. And he went. I, I, I never saw so many guitars in my life. Guitars, guitars, guitars. Mm -hmm. I didn't know which one to pick. I picked one, man, and the thing song is so good. I messed up with the third guitar that I played in there. I said, ah, this one. So i going back now. So I got the guitar. So when the guys took a break now, he said, uh, okay, Tony, you play a few songs. I don't know what the hell it is, but I don't know. And when I started playing, see Warner. And I started singing about Warner, how he's got the worst business in the world, and how we working like slaves down here. How Alan Shapiro is a big joker, and, just, and they love it. It was like I was just making fun of everybody and think, hey, I see Warner going in his pocket, right? Yeah. Warner went and pay off the two men with the accordions yeah. and tell them they could go home. And Leslie and I played for the next hour and a half. Warner said, hey, man, you're great, man. I didn't know. Tony, what you doing working for me, man? You should be a. I said, well, you know, this is New York. You got to find a way to make a little living, right? And I tell you, man, he told me, hey, don't pay. He had told me to pay him $10 a week for this guitar. But when I finished playing, he said, hey, take the guitar and I still owe you some bucks. I tell you, nah, man, it's like, you don't owe me nothing. And it cemented the thing, but I also, when Frank Cherry come now, I had to go back to Warner. So Warner said to me, hey, Tony, I heard you're the instigator downstairs. I said, instigator of what, Mr. Warner? I heard you tell the guys they have to join the union. I said, me. I told the guys that Blue Cross and Blue Shield Right, would cover us two thirds of the money 
but that District 65 union is going to cover us 100 percent 